You are listening to a podcast from Antioch University, Seattle, a leader in social justice education. Welcome to the third and final podcast from the Teaching Crisis and Conflict series, sponsored by Antioch University Seattle's Independent Learning Program. My name is Daniel Kordes. I am a fourth-year student at Antioch, pursuing a liberal arts degree with concentrations in human development and learning and social justice studies. In this podcast, I will be discussing homosexuals in the Holocaust, a hidden population. There was what could be referred to as a homosexual revolution during the Weimar period. Still recovering from World War I, the German nation was looking to rebuild their government as well as an identity. This allowed many, including homosexuals, to establish themselves as part of the German population. Germany, like much of the world, had moral laws that criminalized sexual acts that were viewed as immoral, which of course included homosexuality. The first version of paragraph 175, however, was extremely rigid when qualifying criminal acts. To quote the original paragraph, Unnatural fornication, whether between persons of the male sex or of humans with beasts, is to be punished by imprisonment. A sentence of loss of civil rights may also be passed. The language pertaining to fornication forced the accusers to catch the accused in the act, or, if that failed, have them confessed. The accused homosexual could simply deny that any sex took place, making it difficult to convict anyone as a homosexual. This made the law somewhat ineffective, and the public responded to the ineffectiveness of the law by disregarding it completely. Activists, nightclubs, and academics all started coming out of the closet and came into public view. Among those speaking out was Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld, who was among the most prominent influences in German medicine. Being an open Jew and homosexual himself, Hirschfeld focused much of his research defending sexual and gender minorities, and in 1919 he opened his Institute for Sexual Research. Hirschfeld's work may have been feared by many conservative Germans, but it strengthened the growing homosexual population by advocating for them with solid research. And this led to a booming gay scene. The gay scene in Berlin especially was unlike any other in the world, and just as arts and literature boomed during the Weimar period, so too did the homosexual culture. The bars and nightclubs opened in plain sight, giving homosexual men and women a presence within Berlin society and the German identity. German politics echoed what was happening in the public eye, and during the 1920s, Parliament considered abolishing paragraph 175 altogether. One of the most powerful soldiers under the Chancellor was Ernst Röhm, who eventually served alongside Hitler as the leader of the SA. Röhm was known for being a ruthless and notorious man, and was an easy target during political upheaval during the Weimar period. And in 1931, Röhm was outed for being a homosexual man through personal letters he had written to lovers. Hitler did not attack Rome for being a homosexual. In fact, Hitler and Rome were such good friends that it is likely that Hitler was aware of his sexuality. Rome in the SA had a significant impact in the Nazi party, and not only did he have different political ideologies than Hitler, he also believed that homosexual men were superior to heterosexual men and promoted them to high-ranking officers, almost exclusively. Rome and other homosexuals infiltrated the Nazi party while the homosexual movement gave momentum at an enormous speed. This proved threatening to many who began speaking adamantly against homosexuals. Hitler responded to the homosexual threat by shutting down public gay bars, but he did not actively seek out homosexuals when he began persecuting Jews and communists. This was primarily because homosexuals were an unseen population. It was easy to find Jews and communists because they were labeled on official documents. A homosexual man, however, could hide in the closet. This unseen force, which was known to infiltrate the army of a new political party, was greatly feared, and the fear of the unknown sparked mass paranoia among conservatives. Using propaganda techniques, conservatives portrayed homosexuals as older men who preyed on Germany's most precious resource, young heterosexual boys, and this backlash appealed to the dominant population who similarly began fearing the unseen homosexual population. Hitler responded to the new public concern strategically. He knew that homosexuals were present within the SA as well as within the SS and Gestapo. A mass purge could have hurt Hitler's political advancement. So instead of a mass purge, Hitler responded by executing many members of the SA, including Ernst Röhm. 
This event, known as the Night of the Long Knives, intended to deliver two messages. One warned the public of the consequences of deviating from Hitler's political ideology. The SA had attempted to become independent because they sought more socialistic practices. The other message, however, was that Hitler opposed homosexuality, and in addition to the assassination of Ernst Röhm, Hitler killed the men that Röhm had romantic involvement with. Whether Hitler wanted to purge the world of homosexuals himself, or if he wanted to appeal to the popular public, is unclear. What is clear, however, is that Hitler believed in odic force and magnetism, which is a belief that all people have a spiritual force. Hitler believed that this odic force could be harnessed and used within the Nazi army. As part of this belief, Hitler believed that boys contained the most power, and the best way to access such power was through intimate touching, caressing, cuddling, and so on. Hitler believed that no man should succumb to the temptations of sex and adamantly opposed pedestry. He often warned adult male soldiers that the boys may naturally tempt them with sex, but that they should not allow themselves to be seduced. With the SA now out of the picture, Hitler had to fill the void in his army. This time, he chose the incredibly conservative Heinrich Himmler. Himmler, above all else, was responsible for the persecution of homosexuals during the Holocaust. He was known to be sexually conservative after the Krupp and Eulenburg scandals, which occurred in 1909 and revealed a large concentration of homosexuals among the top-ranking officers in Germany. This, again, played into the mass paranoia of an unseen force that infiltrated the German military. Military. Himmler researched sexual and gender diversities, deeming them deviant. One text specifically, Erotik und Rasse, influenced his aggression against homosexuals. Written by Herwig Hartner, it connected homosexuals to a Jewish conspiracy in which homosexuals would partner with Jews to decrease the reduction of non-Jewish citizens. Hartner and Himmler both acknowledge that homosexuality may occur naturally, but they maintain their belief that it is somehow influenced by a Jewish scandal to create infertility among the preferred race, the Aryan race. In 1935, Himmler influenced the redefinition of paragraph 175. In many ways, this was the biggest step in his personal crusade against homosexuals. The new paragraph removed the rigid classification of deviance, replacing it with a vague terminology. Himmler defended this action, even though it resulted in confusion within the public by stating that homosexual acts were so terrible that they were not to be named. He also feared that young boys might be influenced to become homosexual if they read what it meant to be a homosexual. The big difference in the new definition of paragraph 175 was that anyone could be convicted of being a homosexual regardless of the situation. Because the acts were so unspeakable, the persecutors didn't have to fully defend themselves. Many homosexual survivors of the Holocaust remarked that you could be arrested for as little as a look or a touch. Despite their conservative front, the Nazi party attempted to research homosexuality in great depth. The problem with this is that much of their science was faulty and prejudiced against homosexuals, resulting in terrifying medical procedures and experiments. The first step in Nazi pseudo-medicine was to classify the level of gay. If the man in question was submissive and effeminate, then he was deemed incurable and could not be converted. The Nazis would castrate or assassinate these men. If they castrated them, they would often taunt them as being inferior men. If the gay man was dominant, they would attempt to convert him into a heterosexual with hard labor. As documented in Jake Heggie's opera For a Look or a Touch, gay men would sometimes have their shoulders broken, slung over a hook, and remain there screaming. What is not included in the opera is that the following day they would be expected to move large boulders in the gravel pit. Gay men were also forced to rape women of all ages, and there are accounts of gay men being forced to rape female corpses. This was brought on as hazing an inferior person, but also through the idea that gay men could be trained to become sexually attracted to women through practice. Throughout this course, I have discussed the traumatic history of homosexuals in the Holocaust, much of which has been forgotten because of a dominant heterosexual narrative. It is worth repeating that paragraph 175 remained in effect until 1994, and when World War II ended, many homosexuals were transferred from the concentration camps into prisons. This course only covered a small part of the tragic events involving the Holocaust, and we owe it to the victims of the Holocaust to become informed. 
I invite and encourage you to view and read the resources made available to you throughout this blog. Explicable.